surgery is an operative procedure used to diagnose, repair, or treat an organ or tissue. Different surgeries can be classified by seriousness, necessity, or the specific purpose of the procedure. So there's many types of sur surgeries. Um, and in this lecture, we will only be talking about the general principles for nutrition therapy after surgery. So we mentioned a few times before that we can consider all surgeries as trauma because it hurts at least one type of tissue or organ in the system, uh, sometimes usually multiple organs. The difference between surgery and a real life trauma is that at least in surgery, the operation is done in a controlled environment with medical professionals. We can consider surgery a type of controlled trauma with the purpose of saving a life or curing a disease. But we also must understand that the nature of surgery causes damage to the body as well. Obviously, when the body sustains a certain type of trauma, there will be nutrition implications, especially when patients who undergo surgeries are already malnourished or if they happen to be obese. It's easy, as, it's easy for us to understand why a malnourished patient go, undergoing surgery will have high risk for complications. But why do obese patients have a high risk when they receive surgeries? Well, obesity is also a systemic problem. It affects the function of the whole body, multiple organs and systems. One of the reasons why people with high BMI or a lot of body fat may have increased risk for a post-op complication is that we know that adipose tissue is mainly for storage of actual energy. Compared to lean mass, for example, skeletal muscle, the adipose tissue does not have a whole lot of blood supply. So if we can imagine a patient with a very high BMI and high percentage of body fat, um, and they're having a surgical incision, then inevitably a thick layer of the adipose tissue will need to be cut open. So in this tissue, without the blood supply, um, without the blood vessels that supply oxygen and nutrients, it would be very difficult for the patient to heal. So this is something that's commonly observed for patients who have a high percentage body fat post-op. Also, depending on the type of surgery, a lot of them will have more severe impacts on the normal nutrition processes. For example, if someone has colon surgery, then for quite some time, the patient will not have a functional gut. If the patient had a surgery with you know, a certain portion of the small bowel removed, they may end up with short bowel syndrome. So all of these can severely affect the normal nutrition processes and making recovery, either in the short or long term, more challenging. Other patients who may have increased risk of surgical complications are those who, have, who before surgery already have changes in weight, albumin level, and CRP level. So we know CRP is an inflammation marker, therefore, when, COP, when CRP goes up, that means the patient already has systemic in, inflammation going on. And we know from when we studied malnutrition, loss of body weight already puts a patient at high risk for malnutrition. Again, if they already qualify for malnutrition before the surgery, then their risk for sur surgical complications will be significantly increased. Age and other comorbidities may also play a role in nutrition implications by surgery. Depending on the type of procedure we're talking about, many patients uh, may have different clinical manifestations. As far as nutrition is concerned, usually before surgery, especially if it's not planned, or excuse me, especially if it is planned, if it's not a trauma emergency surgery, 
then patients will be put on NPO for 12 hours at least before surgery. And this is actually maybe changing a little bit in some facilities, and we'll discuss that at the end of the lecture. Uh, many of the patients will receive an NG tube before surgery, and this can uh, serve more than one purpose. For example, NG tubes can be used for suction purposes. That way, if during the surgery, if there's GI distension, then we can apply suction to get the air out of the gut, making the surgery a little easier. Also, we know NG tubes can serve as a route to deliver enteral nutrition. So this tube does have one, more than one purpose. The patient under anesthesia may have more complications caused by the medication. They may have a post-op ileus, and we know that this is when the intestines do not have a lot of motility. So this is a common side effect of the anesthesia medication. Depending on the patient and the medication, as well as the doses, they may have different recovery times. It's also very common for clinicians to check if the patient has bowel sounds. So this would be a good sign for the GI or intestine function. Also, we always want to monitor post-op if the patient reports gas because um, positive bowel sounds and positive gas production is a sign that GI function has recovered. So this would be a good time to resume PO intake, then gradually advance diet the diet is tolerated. So this is something we always check and document in these patients. For nutrition assessment, we definitely need to pay attention to the increased energy and protein requirements. Again, to recover from the surgery, patients need more than the usual. Certain patients, if the surgery is too expensive in terms of energy, this may lead to metabolic stress not to mention that they may suffer from a severe trauma to begin with, and then we have the life-saving surgery that adds more stress to the system. When that happens, we definitely need to remember the increased energy needs and increased protein needs, along with other micronutrients. Some commonly used nutrition problems for nutrition diagnosis include increased energy expenditure, inadequate beverage intake, increasing nutrient needs, altered GI function, and impaired nutrient utilization. So all of these should be pretty straightforward. Again, depending on the type of surgery we're talking about. Is it a skin cancer surgery versus a GI surgery, or is it brain surgery? So we'll be, be, be able to better select the nutrition, program, nutrition problem when we know exactly what surgery we're talking about. In general, the energy requirements would be about 25 to 35 calories per kilogram per day. Protein requirement is much higher. It is 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of ideal body weight. So for this, condition, we want to be using ideal body weight. As a patient's GI function recovers, we want to advance the diet, and we will need to have an individualized progression plan. Current evidence actually supports the practice of progressing patients from nothing by mouth to solid foods as quickly as possible because they will have a better result in recovery and less complications. Therefore, again, we need to assess the patient frequently and see if we can resume a PO diet, and then also see how quickly we can advance it from, you know, if the surgeon starts them out on clear liquids uh, to normal solid food. So this will need to be individualized on a case-by-case, disease-by-disease basis. And just to quickly go over some of the guidelines that are posted um, by Aspen and the Society of Critical Care Medicine for the Nutrition 
support therapy in the critically ill patient. So this was that document that came out in the beginning of 2016. Um, they have a whole section. Section O is on post-operative major surgeries. And so just to bring up a couple of points, um, they do suggest that EN be provided when feasible in the post-operative period within 24 hours of surgery. Um, unfortunately, the quality of evidence is very low, but based on the evidence that we do have, um, it does suggest that we do early initiation of enteral nutrition within 24 hours post-op. Another one is based on expert consensus, and these are for patients who have undergone major upper GI surgery where we cannot use enteral nutrition. So um, they're telling us that PN should be initiated only if the duration of PN is anticipated to be over a week. So unless the patient is at high nutrition risk, PN should be del delayed for five to seven days. And then again, we're going to initiate it only if we think that the patient's going to need it for over a week or at least seven days. And then the last one here, based on expert consensus, advancing, uh, when we're advancing the diet postoperatively, patients should be allowed solid food as tolerated. And a big one here is that clear liquids are not required as the first meal. Um, standard practice in most uh, US hospitals right now is that the first meal after surgery that patients get are clear liquids. However, these guidelines that came out last year um, kind of go against that and, and, you know, there's been evidence supporting that clear liquids are not necessary as the first meal. And I've seen in some facilities, they're really trying to change that. They're um, coming up with post-op diets that um, have more protein, involve more solid foods. So things that are still easy to tolerate, um, but not necessarily just clear liquids. So this is something you may see when you're going through um, your rotation, your clinical rotations. Another thing I wanted to take a moment to discuss, um, I don't believe this is in the book, but I wanted to talk to you guys about ERAS or enhanced recovery after surgery. And the definition of ERAS is that it's a multimodal perioperative care pathway designed to achieve early recovery for patients undergoing major surgery. So basically what they've been doing is re-examining traditional practices and then changing things based on um, based, based on evidence supported practices. So um, maybe changing things up from how we've done things traditionally. And uh, it also is comprehensive in that it covers all areas of the patient's journey through the surgical process. So they do see a reduction in care time by uh, over 30% in some cases and reductions in complications by up to 50%. So these things allow for the patient to be better cared. It also um, leads to decreased costs, which facilities, um, you know, healthcare is expensive, so that's really something important too. And the patients aren't in the hospital as long, which is great for them. Um, the Abbott Nutrition Health Institute, um, which is at anhi.org, uh, they have a bunch of training modules, uh, continuing learning, continuing education things. And there is a really great video on there about ERAS. It's called GI Surgeries, How Costly Are They and What Can We Do to Improve Clinical and Economic Outcomes? And it's given by uh, Julie Thacker. She's a doctor at Duke University Medical Center and they've been implementing ERAS and have had some great success with it. Um, so in order to see the video, you do have to sign up for um, the Abbott Nutrition Health Institute. It's free to do. 
And then, you know, when you become a dietitian, they do have ways that you can earn continuing education units on here too. So um, if this is something you you're, want to look into, then um, I would highly recommend this video. Uh, so just kind of looking exactly what ERAS is. So we see it divided here into pre-op interventions, operative interventions, and post-op interventions. So like I said, we're following the patient's journey throughout um, before, during, and after surgery. And just some things to note, um, you know, ensuring good nutritional status. So we're going to be doing a full nutrition assessment before the surgery to see how they're doing. Um, if we can improve their physical fitness before they go into surgery, that can we can see better recovery results with that. Um, making sure the patient's educated so they know what's going to happen before, during, and after the surgery helps them know what to expect. Um, and a big thing here for nutrition, we see minimal starvation, oral carbohydrate drink, and no mechanical bowel preparation. So for a lot of surgeries, um, They'll have to drink certain um, bowel prep solutions that basically are a laxative to clear out their bowels. So they're saying that that may not be necessary. And also we mentioned that it is common practice for um, patients to be NPO before surgery. Um, you know, going NPO at midnight or 12 hours before the surgery. And what ERAS they've seen using this is actually they've been giving them an oral carbohydrate drink. So this way they're not going into the surgery with low nutrient stores. Because remember, we're causing some trauma, some stress to them through the surgery. So having them go in with their nutrient stores full um, would be beneficial. So there are some oral carbohydrate drinks that are beginning to be marketed uh, for this by various companies. Um, and then we see here, these aren't necessarily related to nutrition in the operative interventions, but, you know, looking at doing certain things for the anesthesia, um, minimizing the operation time and minimal access surgery, so not cutting um, big holes, doing the laparoscopic things can be good. And then again, post-intervention, we see nutrition coming up again. So we want to make sure that the patients aren't feeling nauseous and vomiting. We also want to try and remove all of the um, drains and tubes as early as possible. Because remember, having in any sort of catheters or anything like that are going to increase the patient's risk for infection since they're exposed to the external environment. Also, we do see here consistent with the um, Aspen and SCCM recommendations, the start of early enteral nutrition. And then um, in early enforced ambul ambulation, so meaning that they get the patients up and walking around after the surgery as soon as possible instead of having them stay in bed, which was more of a traditional practice. And then, of course, doing follow-ups is very important as well, seeing how they're doing and helping them manage um, any issues that the patient may be having. So this is kind of general looking at it. Um, there are specific protocols depending on the surgery. And, you know, this is something that's kind of new to the U.S. They've been practicing it in Europe for quite some time now, and we do see its way making, uh, do see it making its way in the United States now. So... Um, if this is something that you mentioned to your clinical nutrition preceptor, they'd probably be pretty impressed because it's not so widespread in the U.S. quite yet. And um, there are some more references posted on Beachboard regarding this, so I do recommend that you take a, chance, take a minute to look at those.